Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, you've given us uh, a lot to think about. Uh, these chairs are not made for short people. Uh, <laughs> um, and a very different uh, kind of conversation to start the Weldon. And I think, I hope you all agree with me, a very important way to frame our thinking uh, in terms of the relationship between what we learn in our college experience and what we do in life. And then I think the take especially, and I'm, I'm reminded of this on a daily basis with the people I work with at the commission, the importance of thinking about how millennials think about jobs and how, what the future workforce is going to need. And so thank you for helping us frame the conversation that way. And, and thank you for helping to change the landscape of Indiana. I mean, I thought that information about what was happening with the extern program certainly excited me. It's just, uh, it's really a very visible way to look at how quickly the economy is changing and how Indiana is not going to be left behind if we're doing the kinds of things you're talking about. I mean, you've spent your life really working in innovation and in companies of your own and other companies and what you're doing now. Uh, we're here with a, a lot of higher education people. Um, and they're, I'm sure, very engaged in change as well, in, in perhaps a different way. But um, how immune do you think higher education is from the world of innovation and change? Um, I would say the $2.5 billion that the venture capital uh, folks are investing are betting that it's not too immune to change. Because uh, they're, they're betting on that future state. Uh, and they have, they're putting serious money behind it. Um, but I, I also would say, I think probably the most helpful way to think about it is this is a very complex system. Um, and it is, uh, I don't think that we can just beat the system harder in order to get the outcomes that we need. You know, in a lot of ways, it feels like, as I, as I just evaluate the structure of the edu educational paradigm and then, and then the structure of the relationship between the employers and, and education, um, there are some structural things that are going to have to have to change as well. Uh, it feels a lot like putting a round peg in a square hole. And so I think just beating on it harder and trying to do more of the same is uh, not going to be the solution. So I, I, I think it's helpful to step back and look at what are other paradigms. Um, and to, to answer your question specifically, what are other paradigms of industries that are where there's heavy amounts of government intervention, uh, where it's the product, the service is being provided is so critical to our country. It's such a, it's, it's, it's considered a critical um, resource that's, that's being deployed. Um, what other industries are like that? And what impact is the pressure of innovation having on them? And, and, and what, what, what kind of, uh, what pressures are being applied in those specific industries? It makes me think of healthcare. So if you think about the, what, if we were to take, if we were to take the same pressures of healthcare and drop them on top of education right now, what would that frame look like? Um, and obviously accountable care, you know, comes, comes uh, to mind. Having a, having a single, having a single payer, you know, system where you you have government heavily increasingly involved as a, as a payer. Uh, and then you also have um, now this outcomes based compensation. Uh, that that would create a very diff that would create a very different paradigm in education if, if all of a sudden the expectation was that you're going to get paid for what that outcome is at the end, and if there's readmittance of that person back into the education system, then that's coming directly at a profit. Imagine if those imagine if that pressure was applied on education. What kind of paradigm difference that would that would that would make? Um, and obviously that's that's another industry that's been very that's been a laggard as, uh, because of regulation and because of, um, because of a lot of different reasons, has been a laggard to um, making a lot of these changes, but they're going through real change right now. Um, another one is banking, and that's, that's the background that I come from. So one of the, one of the things that's happening in banking right now, um, a, couple, a couple different things. One from the consumer perspective, expectation of, of self-serve right now, mobile-enabled service provision, right? I think that's realistic to expect that that's happening in education as well, where the consumer, the student, is expecting those same kinds of resources, access to a knowledge right now via their mobile phone um, with very low barriers to entry. And uh, I think that that's going to continue to happen. And I also think that one of the other differences that I see, though, and I'm curious about, I'm curious about this difference, uh, we've seen a lot of we're seeing a lot of acquisitions and mergers in financial services right now. 
a lot of these financial institutions, there, there were, um, up until a couple of years ago, there were about 15 or 16,000 banks or credit unions in the country. That number is, is continuing to consolidate. Conversations that, we're, you know, that, that, that many of the folks on, on a, at a board level or an ex executive level at banks are having are, how do we downsize our footprint? How do we reduce our physical real estate presence um, and deploy more efficiently via the internet? Um, that's another thing that I could see happening to financial institutions or to, to uh, education as well. You know, having to think differently about real estate, which still today it's, it seems that if there's, there's still a lot of focus on a lot of investment into buildings, well, what, what impact is technology and the internet and deployment of uh, education in that fashion going to have on the physical brick and mortar that we have on the college campuses? Um, and then the, I think the last, the, the other interesting paradigm. Uh, it, universities are higher, you know, education providers are content providers. And so the other industry that's a content provider is the music industry. And we've seen what's happened in the music industry and the impact that that's happened where people like Taylor Swift didn't make, make it big because a music label made them big. They made it big because consumers decided to make them big. And that was via their own choice via the internet. And I think that's the story that, that's the story that would have been told, you know, otherwise is, is, a, is about how um, you can access that content now directly via the web. And about, so then what happens to education in that case? Well, then the professors then become the artists. You know, the, the, the content creators, the content providers then become the Taylor Swifts, which is kind of interesting to put those two together. <laughs> but as they are the content providers, if the, if the system doesn't innovate along with the artist in the same way that the music industry didn't innovate as quickly as what YouTube and some of these other, some of these other platforms enabled the artists to, 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 to really rise, then alternative channels are going to happen for those artists to be able to get their content to the market that desires it. And that, have, well, that will have a fundamental change on higher education as well. Wow, that answer gave us a lot to think about. Um, uh, and I would really like to you know, make sure that all of you know this is really a time for you to ask questions for Mike as well. So um, are there any questions? Or any comments any of you would like to make in response to that or any of Mike's other comments earlier? I think we have, we have mics. We have mics around the room. This will be way more fun. I think I see one over here. If we get questions from the audience. Yes. Um, how you doing? How is this tech development environment different than when we had our tech bubble burst? I'm just curious. As we kind of try to facilitate pipeline development, students moving into this, this environment right now? Good question. Um, I'll answer it in, through two different lenses. One is I think that the, in the tech bubble era, the, with the advent of the internet, people's imaginations ran wild with the potential of what could be. And it outstripped the pipeline's ability to be able to get to adopt that new technology. And there were several different re reasons for that, some of them technological, some of them in the market wasn't just, just wasn't ready for it. Um, some of it, it wasn't, a pro it wasn't a real problem that was big enough that merited having a, a business to serve it. Um, but now, obviously, the tech, the tech infrastructure is sig significantly different. The internet is much more robust. There are many more people that are connected to it. The advent of the cloud has enabled companies to be able to create new technologies much more efficiently and cost effectively than, than otherwise and for consumers to adopt it much more readily. So the pipe has increased so that, comp so that I, I, there are not the same limiting factors as there were back uh, in the, uh, during the bubble. Um, the, second thing, the, the second thing that I would point to though is, and it, I think it reinforces the need for not just creating single-threaded skills-based employees, but people that have a broader, can, can, can be more flexible, self-learn, and be able to apply skills more broadly, is that one of the things that, that's increasingly happening is that um, we're, we're building infrastructure stacks. So we're building, we're building data storage stacks. We're building software on top of that to manage that. And then applications, software applications on top of that to manage that. And so over time, one of the trends that you're seeing is that 
is a, is a very deliberate push to create software that does not require a developer in order to be able to administer it, where more layman users can use the technology without having to have a sophisticated techn technological skill set. However, they do have to have acumen in how the te technology fundamentally works. So I say that as a backdrop because I do think that we will continue to see, uh, we have t we're, we're going to have two conflicting flight paths, I believe. One of them is that technology is becoming ubiquitous in, in a whole slew of different companies, and as a result, that's driving up the demand for tech-skilled talent. Simultaneously, as that technology gets more and more mature, it's going to get driven to be um, much more, um, it's going to be driven to be much more self-service. And as a result, we'll re reduce the number of, of developers, for example, that required to just administer that product. I do not think that this is going to be, this is not going to be a black and white issue. It's going to continue to be an area that's in significant demand. Um, but I think that it begs the immediate need for that talent, for that pipeline of tech-skilled talent right now, not only those that can develop product, but those that can sell in this internet age, those that can market in this internet age, those that can provide customer service in this internet age, and particularly those that can analyze the, the, the huge uh, amounts of data that we're creating right now and make meaning out of it. But I think that the, the over time, um, we, will see that, we will see that mature, um, get to more sustainable state, and um, uh, where, where there will be lots, most everyone will work in technology, regardless of whether they can program in C Sharp or not. Good morning. Uh, quick question for the extern program. Um, wow, that is powerful. Um, can you give us a little window? I'm, well, I'm assu assuming that you're looking for talent wherever it might be in the, in the, in the world, likely, mm -hmm. and I think that's absolutely great. Um, can you give us a little window on how f us in Indiana might think about that um, and having some of our uh, Indiana students, so to speak, or from the state be able to participate? And then secondly, of course, in the tech sector, there's a lot of attention on diversity now and how we bring about both gender and racial and ethnic diversity. How is that in integrated into the program? Great questions. Uh, so on, the, on Indiana's college participation, a uh, majority of the students are from Indiana universities. A third of all the computer science students at Purdue applied to be externs uh, this past year. Over 300 Purdue students. And that's just one school alone. Um, but the, the majority of them are from Indiana schools. So we do have a deliberate emphasis on serving those schools. I think the interesting, one, one of the interesting areas for opportunity is how can we then, how can we take an experience like this and then how can we couple it with a unique educational experience so that even those students, the thing that I think about is the step down the road, how do we, how do we use something like the extern program to lure students to Indiana? And then how do we create a really unique educational product that then they say, you know what, I don't, I want to keep on this track and I'm going to transfer from my out of state university to one that's here so that I can stay on this track. I think that's, a, I think that's possible. Um, so hopefully that answers your first question. To the question of diversity, um, I'm very excited to say that in last year's class of externs, 30% uh, are women, which is significantly higher than the, the industry average. Uh, we put a very deliberate uh, focus on uh, d um, attracting a disproportionate amount of those underserved uh, communities. And the, one, of the, one of the great things is that this community approach, sometimes in a profession that can feel a little um, uncomfortable for those that are not, for those minorities to, to get, to penetrate that industry, by knitting together this community, this group of you know, 130 of their peers, makes it a lot more comfortable for them to be able to enter in. And so we hope that that will continue to be a laboratory for us to, to be able to uh, increase the volume of of minority students. One of the things, one of the critical things though is we, like any of the universities in the room, are rate limited by how many of them are coming through the pipe that are qualified to enter into the program. So we, absolutely, we need lots, of, lots more help at the K-12 level to help divert more of these, more of these students that, are, that have our high potential down the tracks that could get them into programs like the extern program or into your universities. Mike, uh, how are you? Doing well. So, uh, keeping on the extern program, and I know it's only a couple of years old, but mm -hmm. 
can you go a little deeper on the program itself, on kind of the key features of why you believe it's so successful or hopefully will prove to continue to be so successful beyond just the fact that it's, a, it's an internship program? What are the key elements? Yeah, great question. Uh, we, making a, I'll go into the program components and then I, I think there's also, it's critical that the value proposition to the market is very, very clean and simple. And so our value proposition to the companies is, we're gonna create a robust, dependable pipeline of talent to your door. All you have to do is create a great internship experience. We're gonna take care of everything else. One of the deterrents that we hear from companies, again, particularly those that don't already have large HR functions, which is most companies, uh, they don't have the capacity to go recruit. They don't have the capacity to go find places for them to live because they have to find a place for them to live for 10 weeks during the summer. That's really hard. It's a really hard problem. They have to go find stuff for them to do on nights and weekends while they're here, oftentimes in a place that they're not familiar with. And so um, that's what we've taken off their shoulders and just said, hey, you focus on creating a great internship experience, building up your company to be the best it can be. We will provide this supplemental experience that will help to create um, this, uh, this very unique world-class experience for the students and an educational uh, also an educational kind of gap closer for the students as well where they're going to learn things that they wouldn't learn in the classroom otherwise that's going to make them much more employable. Um, programmatically though the main ingredients are don't share this with folks outside the state Please keep it keep it in the room. Um, you have to have great relationships with the universities and the employers because you're having to match the two together and, and you have to understand the calculus of where to find what talent in which places and in which universities, and that's not, a, that's not an easy thing. Um, you have to provide housing. Housing is a big component. We, we underappreciated just how important the, the um, having a turnkey solution to housing and the importance of having them spatially in proximity to each other during the year was critically important to creating that community. Uh, that then causes them to go back to school and be ambassadors. The reason why we, we went from a couple hundred applicants to over 900 applicants is because they all go tell their friends. And when they do that, then um, it has this viral nature to the, the marketing of the program. So great internship experience, um, a, a, a compelling housing uh, solution, and then social opportunities that plug them into the city. One of the things that, the stat that I didn't share, I shared the 12% to 78%, but we also asked them what their, what their impression was of the city and the state. Only 22% had a positive impression before entering the program. After the program, 98% have a positive impression. When you look at the data though, <laughs> thank you. Uh, when you look at the data, there is a huge portion that have really no impression. Or the impression that they have is based on headlines of the stuff that we're seeing in the newspapers today. Uh, which is unfortunate, not the kind of impression that we want to leave. So a big part of it's marketing. And, and, and in order to do that, you have mar marketing and you have sales, and we've gone straight for sales. And we've just said, hey, we are going to get boots on the street, and we are going to you know, find these students, and we are going to directly plug them into the community and plug them into the best parts of the, of the community that they wouldn't experience otherwise. So they're going to baseball games, and they're learning how to DJ, and they're, they're, they're mentoring elementary school kids. Um, to teach them how to code. Um, but then simultaneously, we're bringing in experts and we're teaching them. Uh, we're teaching them skills that they wouldn't have learned otherwise. So they're learning about agile development. And they're learning about, um, they're, having, they're having successful execs come in to speak to them um, about, about their successes. All of those have been the critical ingredients. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Can I ask how, how many of these internships are, I'm over here. <laughs> how, how many of the internships are tied to being really tech? Because when you talked about the careers, you talked about lots of other careers. So are the internships going into sales and these other fields as well? Great question. Thanks for the tee up. Uh, we started in, in tech skilled because we needed to start somewhere. I'm a startup guy, so I want to get just start with the, the nucleus of something and then get it going. And we knew that that was an acute pain point that people were having trouble filling that. And we knew that it needed to be an internship program because if you wait until senior year to recruit tech talent, it's too late. Um, 
So, uh, but I'll, this summer, with, with thanks to help from the Department of Workforce Development and helping us to scale the program, uh, we are going to start a sales cohort. And we're going, to, um, we're going to take a class and put them through a boot camp-like curriculum. And we're going to teach them about probably a type of sales that they've not learned before. And I'll tell you, one of the, one of the we, we do our culture, this is not necessarily the folks we in the room here, but our culture does a disservice to one of the best potential career paths that a lot of these students could go down, which is sales, business development, marketing, et cetera. You can have a lot of success. Uh, you, can, you can differentiate yourself based on metrics, not based on qualitative stuff. Uh, and so we're going to, and that's an acute pain point for companies. And there's a specific, there's a specific type of job that new grads could hop into that could set them on the trajectory toward a great sales career. And so we're going to experiment with that. This summer, we'll have our first class. Uh, this summer, we're going to put them through a boot camp curriculum to teach them some of those, this basically digital sales, tech sales techniques so that they can enter the workforce. And we're going to continue to look for opportunities to expand it um, into other cohorts, too. Mike, I made eye contact with somebody who I promised one more question. Okay. So Hi, Mike. Good morning. <laughs> Kimberly Ewing with Starfish Initiative. And you almost answered my question um, about the state of Indiana and the impression our young people have and you had mentioned coming in and how they look at it is uh, not favorable, but then it gets favorable once they're here. And I wanted to know, what is it about Indiana that attracts them? You're smiling, so I know you have the answer. This is a big question. Uh, Dan dangerous sand you traps know, we, we're, we're Hoosiers, we love our state, right? Uh -huh. But we like to know, what is it about Indiana that attracts them? And then what is it about their experience that keeps them and retains them and gets that number up? Yeah. And, and then to, to top off of that, uh, because we work with uh, our young kids and of course they are mentored um, with our wonderful mentors in the state of Indiana. And, and what can we do uh, as mentors to, to coach them and deliver uh, what is so special about Indiana to keep this fabulous town right here? That's a great Thank question. You. And one that we, I don't think, we don't market ourselves very well as a state at all. Um, and it does a huge disservice to this whole effort to attract and retain and engage talent. Um, I think you have to separate two different demographics and kind of psychographic profiles in order to answer your question. One, young new talent, the, the talent that's coming out of school. The thing that these are, this, and I, I, I am on, um, I, I'm the benefactor of, of being right on the, the, like the first year of the millennial generation. So I kind of straddle the two, and, but I still was still subject to a lot of the same pressure and, and, and uh, emphasis on things like changing the world, on things like make, making it a better place, making an impact that's bigger than yourselves, uh, community service, all those kind of things that were ingrained into our generation cause, cause us to put a premium on experiences over a lot of things, including monetary gain. And uh, also on the opportunity to make an impact and be part of something that's bigger than yourself. I think the greatest thing that we can market to the young generation is that the city, is, the city and the state are on an upward swing where you can be part of something that is, that is, that is on the way up. And you can be part of something where you personally can make an impact. Um, the difference, the, the natural gravitational pull is to places like Chicago, New York City, San Francisco, et cetera, LA because they're the bright, shiny lights. But the reality is that most of those places, their brand is set. There's very little that an individual person can do earlier in their career that's going to make an impact. That is very different here. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to have, have been able to be, a, a, be an example of that and, and to, to have the door open to me and just give me green. All I want is, is green field to run. All I want is space to run. And uh, this, that's something that, that our state and our city uh, afford at this period in time is that we are at an inflection point and the people who are right here right now are going to create the future that we're going to look back on decades from now and it's going to directly impact our, the future state of our state and that's an exciting thing for a lot of young people is for them to be able to make an impact and I think that those of us as uh, those of us of organizational and civic leaders just have to be very careful have to be very cognizant of, of, of keeping that value proposition open and what that means is being inclusive, including the younger generation, as, as, as Teresa referen referenced earlier, opening up opportunities 
uh, to them because it's, it's at the intersection of access and opportunity that is going to attract the younger generation. For the, for the next generation, it's the, it's the, the family component. Um, I just had uh, two families over to our house last weekend. Both families had, have moved from New York City in the last year, both because they had their second child. And the stories that they told about the li their lifestyle when they were trying to raise their kids in New York City, it was horrific. And they were very gainfully employed. But the, 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 the very material depreciation in their quality of life as, it really, as they tried to balance having a family and also having a, having a great career, was really, really difficult. And they moved, they moved here as a result. Um, and so I think that we have to, ha we have to be, ver be very deliberate about crafting a value proposition for that demographic too. And I, I think that we kind of inherit that accidentally, but I don't think we're as deliberate about crafting it as we could be. I'm excited about the regional cities strategy because I think what it's going to do is it's going to cause these regions to band together and be very deliberate about what is their value prop for that kind of, de that kind of demographic. Because the we do naturally inherit a... Uh, advantages, as particularly as it relates to family. Thank you, Mike. You uh, accomplished exactly what I hoped you would do today and got us thinking in a, in a different way, in a bigger way, about what our challenges going forward, but our great opportunities as well. Please join me in thanking Mike for your time.